Your generosity fuels all of Westside's efforts to make disciples, equip families, and share Christ's love here and around the world. Hey, Westside, we have been on this exciting journey here each week in our kids and our student ministry as we have shared the key idea and the key belief with our students and kids. And because of your generosity, we have been able to provide free material for all of our kids and our students. I have seen firsthand the impact that it is making in their lives and in the lives of our families here at Westside. In one small group during this last Believe session, we had three kids accept Christ. Because of the kind of conversations that happened with Believe, we had seven students in the student ministry at Speedway accept Jesus for the very first time. Yes, and of those seven, four have gone on to get baptized, and two are lined up to get baptized here really soon. We believe! And the very next week, they all got baptized. It was an amazing time to see what God's doing in their life. Why did you ask Jesus into your heart? Because He loves us and He gave us everything. And He died on a, a cross for us to take our sins away. I like memorizing the verses and being with my group on Wednesday. I believe everything I am and everything I own belongs to God. I asked you those cards into my heart and then I got baptized. I am so looking forward to the next 10 weeks of the Believe Experience in Student Ministry. I mean, these stories are everywhere. We were at uh, Wednesday nights um, and Jeff Manford was speaking about stewardship and he called teams of uh, two people up to uh, get $50 and he told them to pay it forward. So we were just at Walmart getting some groceries and uh, we were trying to figure out who we should give this money to and uh, there was a need for a single dad who needed some money, um, and uh, we decided that uh, we could help out. Talk to our parents about yeah. it and raise some money from them and talk to family friends and, and family. friends, and then it ended up at what? Uh, $580. $580. And all of a sudden we saw this lady with three kids and a huge uh, basket full of groceries, and there were some crutches like sticking out of it from one of the kids, and we looked at each other and we were just like, that's her. We wanted to buy someone's groceries, so can I buy your groceries today? And she like paused for a sec and she looks at us and she goes, are you serious? And we were like, yes. And then she started crying in the middle of Walmart and she gave us the biggest hugs and she just said, she told us how much this means to her and like that how much she needed it right now. And it was just the coolest thing ever. We saw how God can take something really small and make it big and it really impacted us. Totally saw God in a whole new way. It was so cool and uh, something that we'll never forget. You helped make these blessings possible through your faithful giving. Thank you. Hello, church. Here in the North Sanctuary, the South Sanctuary, uh, those in our Speedway campus and those watching online, a particular shout out today from Jel Jason from Wellsville, Kansas. I don't know where that is, but it's an important place for Jason. Let's give it up for Jason today. Come on. <laughs> Westside Family Church has made a significant investment into your children uh, by providing all of the belief materials for them for free. And we have done this because we love your children. And we also believe fundamentally that in order to help your children grow, they need to know God's word and do it in partnership with your involvement. Amen? Amen. We don't just want to make your kids smarter in the ways of God. We want to see it the word of God, mold and shape them into winners for Christ in the way in which they actually live their lives. And you just saw in the video uh, some of the early results in the lives of our kids. Let's give it up for our kids today. Come on, let's give it up for them. God wants our kids to be winners. God also wants you to be winners. The same passion we have today for the Kansas City Chiefs to win, amen. amen, is the same passion that God has for you to win. It's the same passion. The story is told of the Green Bay Packers, how at an away game, they lost a, a, an away game that they were expected to win. So on the long bus ride home, they made their way back to cold Wisconsin 
and their legendary coach, Vince Lombardi, had them walk off of the bus, put their dirty jerseys back on. They marched onto Lambeau Field into the end zone. And once he huddled them there, he said to them, gentlemen, and he raised up this pigskin egg-shaped object and said, this is a football. <laughs> Vince Lombardi knew that the fundamental way to win a football game is to have a firm grasp of the basics. The same thing is true of the Christian life. We must have a firm grasp of the basics. So in the spirit of that unforgettable night in with cold Wisconsin, ladies and gentlemen, this is a Bible. Knowing that the Bible is the word of God, knowing that it contains truth and God's will for our life is as basic to the Christian life as a football is to the game. Amen. Embedded in God's word are principles that lead to holistic success. Joshua is a main character in the Old Testament. He followed Moses as the as leader of Israel, and his primary mission, if you will, is to move the people of Israel a hundred yards down the field, figuratively speaking, to cross over into the end zone, which is called the promised land is to move them from the wilderness into the promised land so that they could experience a season of great prosperity and peace. And here's the advice that God gave young Joshua on the front end of his mission. It's found on page 212 of your Believe book or Joshua chapter one and verse eight. Here's the advice. Keep this book of law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it, say this with me, then you will be prosperous and successful. The same is true for you and me. If we want to be successful, according to God's definition, you have to read and study the word of God and then have the courage to actually do what it says without reservation or hesitation. That is what God offered up to Joshua. That is what I offer up to you today if you desire to be a winner. This is the door that we're going to unlock today. And behind this door is success. And today we're going to unlock that door by opening up the word of God and giving you the keys to it. And if you were to dare walk through it, you will experience success. I promise. No, Joshua chapter one, verse eight tells us God promises. Now, the key idea to drive what we're talking about today is found on page 209 of your Believe book if you bought it. I'm going to brought it. I'm going to put it up on the screen and invite you to memorize it. But for right now, let's just say it out loud together. Ready? I study the Bible to know God and his truth and to find direction for my daily life. Now today, because this is a spiritual practice, I actually wanna teach you through a passage of scripture to inspire and instruct you on the importance of studying the Bible. The passage is found in Acts chapter 17, verses 10 through 12. You can look it up in your Bible, or I put the passage in your program, and you can look at it. Get out a pen or a pencil. And as I do, I'm going to give you some insights on how I approach this passage of Scripture to prepare it for you today. Now, I'm a graduate of Dallas Theological Seminary, as well as Scott Jones, our new teaching pastor, and we were both... Uh, taught how to study the Bible uh, by a renowned professor, R. Vince Lombardi, if you will. His name is Howard Hendricks, Dr. Howard Hendricks. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, 
Dr. Hendricks had such an impact on my life in the Word of God that I have a few pictures in my office of mentors who influence me, and Prof. Hendricks is one of them. Here's a pic of, uh, I think, there's, here's a pic of uh, Roseanne and I uh, with Prof. Hendricks and his wife, Jeannie. Prof. has since gone on to be with the Lord, but I want to take some of the influence that he put into me and I want to pass it on to you in regards to how to study the Bible. Prof. Hendricks said, when you study the Bible, there are three basic steps that you take, okay? The first one is observation, asking the question, what do I see? The second one is interpretation, asking, what does it mean? And the third is application, where you're simply asking the question, so what? So what? So those are the three steps. Now, first we make observations, and I'm specifically talking today about Acts 17, 10 through 12, just a small passage of scripture. When we approach this passage, we bombard it with questions. Who, what, where, when, why, and how? We just bombard it with questions like you uh, uh, should approach the Bible with super curiosity, like Sherlock Holmes. You should be like Sherlock Holmes, just bombarding the, question, the, the text with questions. Write your observations down with questions and then go searching. So I'm going to put up Acts chapter 17 on the screen, uh, verses 10 through 12. And the first question we're going to ask is, is, what book is it in? And it is found in the book of Acts. Now, you need to know before you dive in what the book of Acts is all about. Now, if you have a good study Bible, I use the NIV study Bible. Uh, you can get a good study Bible, have an introduction to each of the 66 books. Before you read a passage, you should know what that book is fundamentally about. Go to the introduction and read it. Take the time. Now, the book of Acts is the acts of the apostles and how, by God's strength, the Holy Spirit's presence, they started the church and then spread the good news of Jesus throughout the world. That is the purpose uh, and the contribution of Acts uh, to our lives. Now, the second observation we can ask is who? Who is involved? And here you see two characters, uh, Paul and Silas. Now, I have a number of resources because of my job on the different characters in, of the Bible, but you can simply today just go online and Google Paul of the Bible, and you're going to discover about who this guy is and who Silas is. Silas is more of a secondary character. Paul is the main character of this story. So we dive into the life of the Apostle Paul, and we discover that he is a Jewish guy and he had a dramatic conversion experience, an encounter with Jesus. He went from persecuting Christians to becoming a Christian and then being given the assignment by God to take the good news of Jesus Christ from predominantly being amongst the Jews to the Gentiles throughout the world. And we know as we study his life, he took three missionary journeys throughout his lifetime to accomplish the mission that God has given him. Now the question is, where is Paul and Silas at in this particular story? And we see that he is in Berea. He is in the town of Berea. Uh, he is on his second missionary journey. He's just left the city of Thessalonica. It's the text or story right before where he was run out of town because of a riot that took place when he shared the gospel. And then he goes 45 minutes southwest to a little town called Berea, which took him about two to three days on foot. How did I know that? Did I actually go and walk it myself? No, in my study Bible, in the footnote, it told me that, and I just shared it with you, okay? Now, I would encourage you to become familiar with the maps in the Bible. A good study Bible or a good Bible has maps in the back, and it will take and make these stories come alive when you put them to an actual place. The maps are organized chronologically, starting from the Old Testament to the New Testament, so toward the end of your Bible, Every good study Bible has a map uh, signifying the three journeys of Paul. And you will see here how he moved from the town of Thessalonica west to the town of Berea. So that's observation. Oh, we could spend so much more time there, but that gives you an idea. Now we move to the second step, observation, interpretation. What 
does it mean? Now, in this passage of scripture, I want you to take a look at it and see if you can discover the three things that the Bereans do when they encounter the teachings of Paul. Okay, as you read this, the brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. When they arrived, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. Now, these were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica. And here's the first one. For they received the word with great eagerness. Here's the second thing they did. Examining the scriptures daily to see whether or not these things were so. Therefore, many of them believed along with a number of prominent Greek men and women. So we see three things that the Bereans did. They received the word, okay? They examined the scriptures and they believed. So let's take the word, they received the word. What does that actually mean? It means they didn't just receive it. The text goes on to say, they received it with great eagerness. Now, I'm going to go on to do some searching. And this is what's really cool about um, the Believe experience. This is, uh, it takes a major topic in the Bible, and then it draws a series of scriptures around that particular topic. Uh, the monks called this florigium, which is a, is a horticultural term that means the culling of a bouquet of flowers. And the monk would say, would bring a series of scriptures together around a particular topic and then would see themselves as a bee taking pollen out of each of the varieties of scriptures. And that's what we've done with Believe. We have taken a, a floral arrangement, a bouquet of passages throughout the Bible on a particular topic and we invite you like a bee to suck the pollen out of each one and get the taste of that in your mouth. As a matter of fact, on page 215 of your Believe book contains Psalm chapter 19, one of the important passages of scripture related to the importance of the word of God in your life. Chapter 19 in verse 10, we are given this word from the psalmist, speaking of the word. They are more precious than gold than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the honeycomb. Several times in the scriptures, the Bible is referred to as honey. And so I dug a little deeper in my research and I discovered that in Jewish culture, the rabbi would gather children in different age segments. And the first one he would gather would be from the ages of six to nine, and he would uh, be responsible for immersing them in scripture. This first experience of the Jewish rabbi to the six to nine year old was called Bet Sepha. That was the name of the experience. And during this season, the child would be responsible for memorizing verbatim the first five books of the Old Testament. Sometime when you have a little bit of time, scroll through just the number of pages in your Bible, or if you have it online, just go like this. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. They had it all memorized verbatim by the time they were nine years old. I am only asking our children to memorize 30 key ideas and 30 scriptures. You know what that makes me? That makes me a pushover. But we have 220 kids of Westside Family Church that are currently tracking with all of this, and I'm super excited about that. Now, at the beginning of this journey, the rabbi would gather the students together and they would have a slate where they're going to begin to memorize. And he would take out some honey. And then he would take the honey and he would put that honey on their slate. And then he would ask them to lick the honey mm, off of the slate. Mm, so sweet. What a special treat. And then as he did that, he would say to the kids, may the word of God be like honey on your tongue. May the word of God be like honey on your tongue. In the Old Testament, a guy named Ezekiel is being commissioned to be a prophet. And his mentor said to him in Ezekiel 3, 3, look at this, son of man, eat this scroll 
I'm giving you and fill your stomach with it. So I ate it and it tasted as sweet as honey in my mouth. That's my passion for you. That when you open up the word of God and you taste it, it will taste like sweet honey on your tongue. Now, the next step is application. Observation, what do I see? Interpretation, what does it mean? And then application, so what? So we take this first thing that they did, receive the word and ask, so what? What does it mean? We need, the application is, to do the same thing that the Bereans did in relationship to the word of God. We need to taste its sweetness. Now, to receive... We go all the way back to chapter four of our Believe journey, where we looked at the belief in the Bible, and we were invited here to give the Bible authority in our lives. We need to submit to it. Listen to this. We need to decide before we even open it up that we have determined that we're going to submit to what the Word of God says, and we're going to obey it. Even before we opened it up, that's the posture of the winner in Christ. Even when you come to passages that you don't fully understand, and particularly when you come to passages you don't like, you've already agreed, regardless, I'm going to give my life to it it, because we trust the author, knowing that the author is going to lead us to a good place even beyond our own understanding. We trust it, and we do what it says even though we don't always fully understand it or we don't always like it. The Bible is not like a buffet. You cannot pick and choose the parts that you want. If that is how you're approaching the Bible, it will explain why you're not experiencing the power that is available to you in the Christian life. It doesn't work like that. As Prof. Hendricks told Scott and I and all the students, it's the Ten Commandments, not the Ten Suggestions. But people today, more than ever, struggle with the idea of giving the Bible authority in their lives. Maybe you do. But at some point in your Christian journey, you're going to have to decide where you stand. As for me, uh, you know, I give my whole life uh, to the studying of this book. And so there's no way that I want to give my life to a book that is anything less than the actual word of God. And so I've done my homework. I've looked at the pros and the cons and the history of this book and its journey to us today. And I have become convinced in my mind that this is the word of God. And you need to decide for yourself. Now, back last fall, we asked you to give us some feedback on where you stand on a variety of issues. And we know where you stand on this issue. So I'm gonna ask you to guess in your mind. West Sider's view on the authority of the Bible. How many, what's the percentage of Westsiders who said they give the Bible full authority in their life? Before we put it up, guess in your mind. Got in mind, number? And here's the answer. It is, I believe the Bible has decisive authority over my life, 56%. Now, you say, is that good or is that bad? Actually, in comparison to other churches around the world, it's about, well, a little better than average. But as you might suspect, I'm not happy with that. And my goal and my passion is to jump up and down and encourage and inspire you, the other 44% of you, to cross over and give the Bible full, decisive authority in your life. Can I get an amen? All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. The Bible wants to teach you. The Bible wants to rebuke you. How many like to be rebuked? I don't, but you gotta get into the word of God and say, I give you permission to rebuke me today because I wanna be thoroughly equipped for every good thing, God, you have designed for me. It reminds me of the story I read about a Christian woman who was afraid of flying, and so she always carried her Bible with her to provide some comfort. One time she's uh, uh, on a plane, and she sits next to a guy that sort of uh, smirks and chuckles when she pulls out her Bible to read it. And the guy said to her, you don't really believe all that stuff in there, do you? And the lady said, well, yes, I do. It's, it's, it's in the Bible. 
Well, she, and then the guy went on to say, well, what about the guy who was swallowed up by the whale? She replied, oh yeah, Jonah, I believe that story. It's in the Bible. Still smirking, the man says, well, how do you suppose he survived all that time he was inside of the whale? And the woman replied, well, I don't really know. I guess I'll just ask him when I get to heaven. Well, what if he isn't in heaven? The man asked sarcastically, to which the lady replied, then you can ask him. <laughs> so they receive the word. We need to receive the word. Second thing we noticed is that they did this, examining the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. What does this mean? They not only received the word, but they researched the word. The word examine in the Greek language is a legal term, and it draws up the way in which an attorney like my son uh, in Washington, D.C., the way he examines a text and dives into a word seeking its meaning is like super, super intense, and we are invited to do the same thing. And here, they are studying the scriptures to make sure that what Paul, this new guy that's walked into town, what he is saying matches what they are of confidence in, and that is the word of God. And I invite you to do the same very thing with anybody who stands on this stage. Don't take what they say as gospel truth. Go into the word, and if what they are saying doesn't match up with the word, disregard it including myself. Amen? They researched the word. Now, the question is application. What are we supposed to do with this in terms of our reflection on the word of God? We see here that the Bereans examined the scriptures how often? They examined the scriptures daily. So we asked the question, how many Westsiders examined the scriptures daily? Okay, so um, we're going to put that up. I reflect on scriptures daily, 20%, 20%. Now, how's that in comparison to the rest of the country? Uh, about average, so don't be so discouraged, but I have to tell you, I'm not happy with that. And so my job is to jump up and down, get excited, uh, to try to get more and more of the 80% to open up the word of God. And I know it's hard with the, with the complexities of your life and the busyness of life, and it's not fair for me because, you know, um, you know, this is my job, you know, to study the Bible daily. I'm paid to be good. You're good for nothing. <laughs> but this is why I'm so passionate about Bible engagement for you. I really am. We tackle a study like believe, uh, and we'll do some really cool things in the days to come about significant topics of the Bible, books of the Bible. And what we like to do is set you up in such a way that you can succeed and you can dive deep into the word of God. And I want to remind you why I'm so passionate about the way in which we're going about this is that it digs the word of God deep into your life. If you recall what we invited you to do with the belief studies, number one is to personally study the Bible on your own, to read this chapter and memorize. Number two, to engage in a small group discussion around the same topic. Number three, when you come to church, the sermon will be on the same topic. And fourth, and really super important, is family alignment. At the same time that you're studying this, we're going to put your children and students on the same program so the whole family is diving deep into the Word of God so that you might taste that it is as sweet as honey. Why is this such a big deal? Because the Bible tells us that his word, once it goes out, will never return without first accomplishing its purpose in your life. But we got to get it in you. We know from research that, and, and you have confirmed this in your response to us, that the number one catalyst for spiritual growth, which is what we're going for, for you to grow spiritually, is Bible engagement with no close second. So we're putting all of our eggs into that basket for the sake of your spiritual growth. Can I get an amen? Amen. Now the story comes to a close with this result. Therefore, many of them believed along with a number of prominent Greek men and women. They received the word, they researched the word, and now we see they responded to the word. They responded. 
They just didn't get smarter, but they actually did something about it. The Bereans believed. Application, so what to us? We need to believe God's word. We need to do what it says. The goal is not simply to become smarter in the things of God, but rather for it to transform you and change you into the image of Christ. And that's what we're going for. So as I wrap up, I want to I uh, tell you about uh, an example of this. And today is Sanctity of Life Sunday. Today is Right to Life Sunday. And I'm new, so you have no idea where I stand as it relates to the sanctity of life. So I'm going to tell you and plainly where I stand, and this may cause some of you to like me less, and for some of you it might cause you to like me more, but being liked is not what I'm shooting for. What I am shooting for is to move you closer to a growing relationship with God and for me to align my life to the authority of Scripture. I am severely committed to aligning my life to God's word and leading you to do the same. So as a result, I am deeply, I can't say the word deeply enough, I am deeply pro-life. I'm deeply pro-life. And I am leading you into the same direction. I don't hold this position because of any political alignment that I have in my life. I do this because the word of God leads me in that direction. Uh, there's no way that you can read the Bible and not be for the protecting of life, particularly for the one who is defenseless and has no one to protect them. Now, that doesn't mean I'm insensitive to all of the issues that surround the topic, including the emotion that is involved when one day you wake up and this is your story. You are pregnant and you don't want to be. So I want to tell you a story that I came across when I lived in San Antonio of a woman who was in that situation and she made a very courageous decision. But I want you to hear her story from the lips of her baby, who is now a full-grown man. Take a look at this. My name is Mike Shero. In 2006, my wife and I moved to San Antonio to be near some family. Her family lived here, and within a short time, we were plugged into church. We were doing ministry stuff, and I was at a Lackland Air Force Base visiting some friends, and I was going there frequent enough I needed to become a chaplain, so I was getting a visitor chaplain pass so I could get on and off base more easily. I was leaving the base the first day I got my pass and my mom called from Alaska and she said, Mike, what are you doing? And I said, well, this may sound random, but I just left Lackland Air Force Base and I'm now a U.S. Air Force volunteer chaplain. Don't worry, I'm not changing my job. I just got a pass so I can get on and off base more easily. Phone call went silent. I said, mom? And she said, how, how could you? How, how could I what? And she hung up and I called and eventually got through to her and my call was like an emotional grenade had just gone off. She was ballistic and, and crying, I can't believe you did this to me. First you moved to San Antonio and then, and then you're at Lackland and then you're going to the hospital there. Why would, why would you do this to me? And I'm just dumbfounded going, what have, I, what have I done? I don't know the story. I'd known that I'd grown up with early memories of a, of a domestically violent home but I didn't know what San Antonio mattered and she finally unpacked and said, Mike, I was, I was in the Air Force. I was a basic trainee at Lackland Air Force Base. That's where, that's where I was sexually assaulted. That's where I began a violent marriage to your dad. That's where when I was in the hospital there, everyone around me said, ma'am, just, let's just abort the baby. Let's, you don't need to deal with that. And while I didn't know what was gonna happen next, I knew that God valued life and that was not an option. And you're that, you're that baby, Mike. And I swore the one place I would never go back in my life was I was never gonna go to San Antonio, Texas, never back to Lackland Air Force Base. And she'd never even told me about it. But because she chose life that day, I'm here. God brought me back to the very city where in her mind was evil that I could do his good work. And mom, thank you. Thank you for the courage of making a decision to have life. I'm here because you made that choice. What a powerful story. A mother who was afraid, but in the midst of being afraid, she trusted God, and look what God did. Took the baby back to the same place where this horrific offense took place. She moved to Alaska 
as far away as she could be from San Antonio. And then what did God do? Move that baby as a full grown man back to that same city, not knowing his story. And not only to the same city, but to Lackland Air Force Base Hospital to the very same place where the offense took place. And now her son, who was a full grown man, is offering ministry to people in that same place who need help and restoration. Mike Cheryl knows full well that the word tastes like sweet honey. And today he is the CEO of C12, the largest convening of Christian CEOs in the world. Look what God did through her obedience. As powerful as this truth is, there is another one that is equally moving and as powerful, and that is that the Word of God offers a man and a woman, for whatever reason, ignorance, pressure, weakness, convenience, fears, what God offers to that person if they decide to end a pregnancy. And I'm fully aware that in a church this size, there are many of you in your story where you have taken the life of a child. And that's not right. You shouldn't have done that. But here's a very powerful truth that lays alongside of this powerful truth of life. John chapter one and verse nine, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. The word of God says God will forgive you and you do not have to live with this pain and shame anymore. You may not be able to remove all the consequences, the scars or the memory, but you will be forgiven by God. If God forgives you, then it's time for you to forgive yourself. In the Old Testament, David committed adultery and then to cover it up the pregnancy, he had the husband killed. David applied. 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9 and confessed it in Psalm chapter 51 verse 14. He cries out to God, deliver me from the guilt of my bloodshed, O God, you who are God, my Savior, and my tongue will sing of your righteousness. God not only forgave David, but even with, all, with this blemish in his life, to this day he is known as a man after God's own heart. And you, even with the decision to terminate a pregnancy, whether you are the woman or the man who forced or encouraged it, you too, like David, can receive the forgiveness of God and be considered a man or a woman after God's own heart. Bible study is a key door that leads to success. And today we have unlocked that door for you. Say it with me, church, ready? I study the Bible to know God and his truth and to find direction for my daily life. If you have the courage to actually walk through it, you will experience God's success. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a Bible. And all of God's people said, Amen. 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 In the spirit of what we've been doing in this, uh, uh, on the spiritual practices, we talked about not just talking about it, but giving you a chance to experience it. Um, we're going to give you a chance to do that today. The basics in football are blocking, tackling, and actually catching the ball. I'll tell you, these first three chapters that we've studied are the basics of the Christian life worship prayer and Bible study. These are the basics of the Christian life. So I'm going to give you a chance to practice all three of them right now. I'm going to invite you to stand to your feet. Also uh, going to ask our prayer partners if they would come forward right now. Please make your way forward right now, our prayer partners. We've got a couple of them coming down. And we're going to do three things. One, Troy's going to lead us in a couple of uh, beautiful worship songs. So worship God with your whole heart. Number two, if you came into this place today and you would like to have someone pray for you, we've reserved the time in this service for you to do it right now. To step out 
and to have one of these people pray for you. Maybe it's a decision that you want to be named amongst the 56% and you want the courage to give the word of God the full, the full authority in your life. Or maybe you have a, a desire to receive the forgiveness of God for something in your life and you want to walk out of here without carrying that shame anymore. I would encourage you to do that. Or maybe you have a, a burden for yourself or for someone else. These people would love to pray with you and for you. And then in the middle of all of this, uh, Troy's gonna lead us in, in a scripture reading and taste when you read those scriptures that the word of God is as sweet as honey.